all the roads seem to lead back to John Wycliffe. He's called the morning star of the Reformation because in the same way as you've got the planet Venus arrives over the horizon just before the dawn, and there's this brief little glimmer of light before the full dawning of the sun. So it was with John Wycliffe that before the Reformation, maybe about 100, 150 years beforehand, he turns up in what one of our interviewees describes as the darkest days of the church. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. I'm Ruth Jackson, and today I'm joined by Murdo MacLeod, a director and producer who runs Trinity Digital, a Scottish film production company. Now, Murdo, you've been involved in a new film about John Wycliffe, which will be coming out 600 years after his death. Would you tell us just a little bit about this about this film? Certainly. Thanks very much for having me on. Uh, the film is called Morning Star, and we started producing it about maybe, well, I started looking up the Wikipedia article on John Wycliffe back in 2016. So that's probably where everything starts from originally. But in 2019, we produced a promotional reel for it, just like a three or four minute um, taster tape, which we could then send out to people to see whether they were interested in supporting the project. That got a, a lot of enthusiastic response. And based on a lot of people's generosity, we were able to gather the funds to go forward. So since uh, I think it was, let me see now, in the middle of 2020 that we started filming. No, no, 2021, because of course COVID got in the way and yeah. COVID caused a lot of problems for everybody. But uh, for us, we were able to film in 2021. We all had to have our masks on and COVID tests day by day to make sure that we weren't infecting each other. But uh, we filmed for uh, three weeks doing block one and then one week doing block two. And then two days wow. doing block three, and we got everything done. Gosh, it's quite a labour of love then. <laughs> it really is, yeah. It's been a project that's uh, been close to my heart, I guess, for or, all that time. It's uh, it's one thing to work on someone else's project, but when it's a project that you've been working on yourself and have created yourself, you do feel this sort of passionate connection to it. So now that the film is ready to release, I'm hoping that other people will be able to share that passion and uh, mm. enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed making it. So what was it about John Wycliffe that drew you to want to make a film about his life? So Wycliffe is one of these fascinating characters. He's a name that I've heard uh, since I was a kid because I grew up in Christian circles and these figures were part of that sort of culture. But he wasn't someone whose story I had really ever heard all that much. But a few years ago, I made a film about John Knox, um, the Scottish reformer. And based on that, I started exploring the whole sort of Reformation story that crosses over all of Europe from, uh, I guess, Iceland in the north to Turkey in the south. It really was a massive, massive story. And I thought, I really want to be able to tell this story, this huge, huge story. And I realized that it was simply way too big to mm. tell in, in, in any... Uh, in the kind of detail that you would want. You can give a sort of historical overview, but it's a bit dull. You really want to get into people's individual stories. And um, and I worked out, well, if we're going to tell that story, we have to start at the beginning. And where is the beginning? Well, all the roads seem to lead back to John Wycliffe. He's called the morning star of the Reformation because in the same way as you've got the planet Venus arrives over the horizon just before the dawn, and there's this brief little glimmer of light before the full dawning of the sun. So it was with John Wycliffe that before the Reformation, maybe about 100, 150 years beforehand, he turns up in what one of our interviewees describes as the darkest days of the church. Mm. And he shines this light of a new way of approaching Christianity and of understanding what Christianity is all about. And that becomes for many people, the model of what uh, the Reformation is going to be later on. So he's, he's a fascinating character. And does he mean anything to you personally? Or, or is that something you've kind of discovered as you've been making the film, learning more about him? Is, is there something that's really impacted? Like obviously, you're talking there about kind of the legacy of Christianity as a whole. But is there anything that's sort of impacted you personally? Yeah. I, as I say, I hadn't really understood John Wycliffe's story before I started investigating mm. him as a sort of a legacy figure, if you like. But then 
once I started connecting with him, well, you can't really make a film for two years without connecting with the main guy. And yeah. uh, I, I, I find John Wycliffe to be a really, really fascinating person. He was incredibly clever. He was the master of Balliol College in Oxford for a while. He was one of the top scholars in the whole of Europe, really, because Oxford at the time was one of the most uh, intellectual centres in Europe, and he was one of the top guys in Oxford. So by extension, he has to be one of the cleverest guys in all of Europe. And despite this sort of position that would come with all that intellect, he was quite happy to give it all up to pursue truth. Because for him, truth was was ultimate. And even if the pursuit of truth led you into uh, banishment and exile, as it did in his case, it was worth it. Because mm. truth w is something far, far more important than success or honour or all the things that we typically prize in our day-to-day -day lives. So I found him a hugely inspirational figure. And then, of course, he's known as the man behind the first English Bible, mm. which uh, is something phenomenal in and of itself. Even if he wasn't considered morning star of the Reformation, there's this other massive factor as well. Who knows really whether he himself personally was the one translating the Bible or not, but he was certainly the man who inspired the project. And for me, that's, that's a beautiful thing. It's really qu quite marvelous that a, a, a figure who was considered quite controversial in his own day can be admired and appreciated by people from right across the Christian spectrum today because of the passion he had for the Bible. And I think that it's a passion that uh, I've learned to appreciate a little bit more uh, studying, studying Wycliffe's life. This feels like a massive question, but what do you think we can learn from Wycliffe? It is a massive question because he had so many fascinating ideas. And I think uh, one of the things that we try to do in our film and in the, uh, in the website that goes alongside it is to try to unpack some of these ideas a little bit further. And I think some of them will appeal to certain people in different ways and we'll connect with them uh, in unexpected ways. For me, one of the things that I found really fascinating about John Wycliffe was his, the way he looked at creation, at the world around him. He didn't just see it as atoms and molecules, material um, constructs, but he looked at the patterns and the designs that these molecules are based on. So when he saw, for example, an apple, he didn't say God created the atoms that make up this apple, though that is true. What he said was God created the concept of appleness that allows an apple to exist as a concept as well as a, a, a physical object. So everything, whether it's a number, whether it's a color, whether it's a relationship, all of these things were designed directly by God. And this I find fascinating because it allows me to look at the world around me in quite a different way. I don't just see, oh, there is a tree, but I can see there is height, there is beauty. All of these sort of abstract nouns that we think of were created themselves by God. So for me, this was quite fascinating. But I think that other people might find other things that he wrote fascinating because he was uh, a, a very broad-minded individual and, and was excited about a lot of different things. And so for someone who would say, you know, this man died 600 years ago, what relevance could he, could he possibly have for, say, a teenager in, in, in the West today? And what would you say to, to someone? Well, I, I think, put it like this, C.S. Lewis said that it's very good for us to read books from the past because they have a different perspective on life than books that are written in the present. He even said it would be just as good to read books that are written in the future. It's just a little hard to get a hold of them. <laughs> but I think that it's really helpful for us to see a different perspective on life because if we're only in our sort of little 21st century echo chamber, we're not seeing the world as people in the 14th century saw it. 
And there's nothing to say that the way that we see it is better than the way they saw it. We maybe have discovered more in terms of science, but that's just one aspect of what life is all about. And where they got things wrong as we would see it, it's easy for us to just say, okay, well, maybe they got that bit wrong, but look at this next chapter. That's amazing. And nobody in the 21st century would ever be saying something like this. So uh, for me, it's all about getting a different cultural perspective on life. Let's let's talk about you for a bit. You said that you sort of grew up in Christian circles. Does that mean that you've always been a Christian? Um, I was born into a Christian family. My dad's a minister. Um, he's retired now, but he was a minister for a long, long time, over 50 years, I think. So I grew up in that culture. And even as a child, that was my worldview, was that there was heaven, there was hell, there was uh, Jesus who has saved us, um, and so on. And it was very, it was made very clear to me as a child that if I didn't put my trust in Jesus, then I was going to go to hell. So that was my worldview. And I remember even as a child looking at a, a dog passing out the window and thinking to myself, I wish I was a dog like that because dogs don't go to hell when they die. So this was really, it was, it was something that gripped me from the inside out, but somehow didn't connect that I could be a Christian myself. Uh, you know, it was the, the worldview that I was in, but I personally wasn't in the right place for it. Mm. And so this became a bigger and bigger issue for me as I was going through high school. And, or I should say maybe primary school, yes, because it was when I was an early teenager, maybe about 12, 13, 14, that I... Um, I remember I was reading Lord of the Rings at the time, and it's my favorite book. I, I really enjoy it. But this one time, I just I couldn't manage to focus on it because I was thinking, this is just me entertaining myself, but if I die, I'm going to go to hell. Wow. And it was quite a horrible thought. But I, uh, I remember I just put the book to one side, and I got down on my knees, and I prayed that I would be forgiven and would be able to become uh, part of Jesus's family. And it wasn't that this was the first time I'd ever prayed that. I prayed this prayer many times, but I think this was the last attempt. It felt like it was like I didn't have any more to give after that point. And, uh, and I would say that for me, that was a massive turning point because later on that day, I remember I was cycling out on my bike. I grew up in the Isle of Skye, so uh, it was a beautiful place to cycle around. But this one time I was coming down a hill and it suddenly seemed as though I had ridden out of a world of black and white and into a world of full technicolor. It just mm. seemed as though the, the sky was bluer, the grass was greener, everything was just more than it was before. And I could sense God's presence in a way that I, I had never experienced it before. And I came to the conclusion that Jesus has promised that he will save anyone who puts their trust in him and who asks him for forgiveness. Well, I had asked him for forgiveness, so therefore he must have saved me. So it was a sort of a, a logical little twist, but it got me to the point of thinking, therefore I must be already a Christian. Because if I die and I'm in front of the judgment seat and someone is saying, you've got to go to hell now, I can say, hang on a second, I prayed for forgiveness and you promised that if anyone prays for forgiveness, you would save them. And so, therefore, I must be saved. So for me, as a teenager, that was a crucial turning point. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I carried on like that, I guess, through the rest of high school and university. And I quickly got marked out as the Christian. So wow. that was an interesting life. So you were quite the theologian at such an early age. Well, so growing up in a pastor's house, I think you do uh, develop certain... Yeah. Uh, familiarity with the with the theology I guess yeah yeah I'm a pastor's kid as well so you then you sort of got into filmmaking how did that happen well uh, it's an interesting story because when I was a kid I wanted to be a wizard who doesn't want to be a wizard <laughs> exactly but then I realized as I was growing up that there's not many career opportunities for wizards sure and so I thought well if I become an actor maybe I'll be able to act the part of a wizard and that'll be just as good but then that, well, that kept me going through university. And then when I finished university, I tried to become an actor. And it's not easy becoming an actor. 
and I found that uh, I, you know, I, I, I was getting a little bit here and there, but not much. And eventually, I, I made a sort of a segue into film directing instead. Um, it was something that I started when I was in school, picked up a, a, a camera, and along with the drama club, we were making our first film. Um, and then when I was going through university as well, I was the one who was trying to make little films and videos. But eventually I, I went to film school in Glasgow and studied it properly. So that was 2011 I graduated from there. And why is it important for you to be making films that talk about Christianity and, and share something of the message of the gospel? I don't always set out to explicitly make a film that is if evangelistic or, you know, preachy. Uh, in fact, I try to avoid making a film that's preachy because I, I feel that preaching is best done by a minister in a church, not by a filmmaker with a camera. And I, I, I'm, I can see the problem that with a lot of Christian films, they actually end up becoming propaganda, mm. um, trying to push a particular message at the expense of the art form of film itself. So that's one side. But on the other hand, I realize one of the things that we were told in film school over and over was be honest, be yourself, be true to your own perspective. And I am a Christian. And so for me to make a film that is specifically not Christian or is trying to minimize Christianity in some way would not be honest to myself. It wouldn't be the way that I actually see the world as it is. And so for me, as a Christian, the only right thing to do is to make a film that comes from that perspective. I want to make a film that everyone can watch and appreciate. I, I think Morningstar is like that, that you can watch it whether you're a Christian or not. But it, it, it's, that's my perspective on life. I look at life from a Christian perspective. And so I would tell a film from that same perspective. So let's just, as, as we finish here, let's just talk a little bit more about um, Wycliffe, what, what do you think is his lasting legacy and impact? Again, that's a huge question and it feels like there's so many different facets there. But but what do you think you personally are going to take as his kind of lasting legacy? And what are you hoping that people might learn about him through your film? I, I think Wycliffe will forever be connected to the Bible in the English language. And mm -hmm. as an extension of that, the Bible in the vernacular language of the people directly read appreciated and understood so it's no use having a bible that's just sitting on a shelf and not being read or a bible that's in a kind of a language that you don't really speak in that you have to get your head around this sort of language change or language barrier to be able to to get to it because for Wycliffe the bible was the word of god it was God actually speaking directly through these words that are on the page into uh, the lives of the people of the day. And so nothing was more important than that people would be able to hear God speak. And he speaks through the words of the Bible. So for me, that, that's, that's Wycliffe's legacy, is that people are reading Bibles today. Um, and... The more that we read our Bibles, the more we honor Wycliffe's legacy. It's, uh, he's, he's a Bible man uh, from his center outwards. That, that's the key thing that motivates him, that excites him, is exploring what God is saying to us in, in his word. So for me, that's, that's definitely the number one thing that I think about when, when it comes to Wycliffe. All these other things like being the morning star of the Reformation, making a massive social change and uh, religious change and so on, that, that's important. But the importance of the revolution is based on the Bible. Uh, and, and that's really where it all comes down to. So final question, and this might be really difficult to answer, but imagine John Wycliffe goes back to his younger self, sort of after everything he's learned along the way, he's begun the translations of the Bible, he's sort of begun to um, butt, butt against the clergy, you know, argue against the papacy, all of that. He goes back to his teenage self. Do you think there's anything that he would say to himself with the wealth of knowledge that he's acquired along the way? I mean, that 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 is, that is an interesting question. Um, there is one very simple quote from Wycliffe, 
uh, which goes, this I know, that in the end, the truth will prevail. And I think that that is excellent advice for Wycliffe to give to his younger self, if we're running with that, that idea, or for Wycliffe to give to any of us as well, is that whatever happens, lies go around the world faster than the truth, but the truth will be the thing that endures in the end. Um, there's a thousand different lies, but there's only one truth, and yet it's that one truth that will be the thing that endures in the end. So we have it in our film that there's a little lecture that Wycliffe is giving his students, and at the end he says, therefore we have proved our thesis, but the corollary follows, that we must seek the truth, seek it with all our hearts, seek it and find it. And I think that that is probably the advice that he would give to his younger self. I mean, that's great advice for everyone, isn't it? Murdo, how do we find out about your film? Well, our website is www.morningstarfilm.co.uk. And uh, if you go to that, you'll be able to uh, get the link for watching it online, for buying the DVD, or very excitingly, we're going on a tour, taking the film around a bunch of places in the UK, doing public screenings. Doing a tour of the whole UK. Absolutely. We're not missing anywhere. So Brilliant. you'll get all the details on the website, www.morningstarfilm.co.uk. Great. Well, Murdo McLeod, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com.